This section of the course is all about the matrix inverse. Before getting into any of the details about how to compute the inverse and how to know whether a particular matrix even has an inverse, I want to first explain the idea of the matrix inverse. So what does the inverse mean? How is it used? Why you should care about the matrix inverse? And why you should avoid using the matrix inverse whenever possible. By way of introduction, I would like to first tell you about the scalar inverse. Now, the scalar inverse is something that you already know about, but you might not use this name. So here's a simple equation. The goal here is to solve for x. So how do you solve for x? Probably the answer that you're thinking is to divide both sides of the equation by 3, and that will isolate x on the left-hand side. Now, that's true, but I would like to explain that procedure using slightly different terminology. So what I'm going to do is multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of 3, which can also be written as 3 to the power of minus 1. So this is 1 over 3. And now what happens is that the 3 inverse cancels with the 3, and we're left with just 3 inverse on this side of the equation times 1, of course, but you can ignore this. So now in this equation, we've discovered that x equals the inverse of 3. So that solves this equation. 3 times the inverse of 3 equals 1. Now, I've mentioned in a previous video, I think it was the very end of the section on matrix multiplications, that there is no such thing as matrix division per se, the way there is a scalar division. But the concept is similar. Okay, so now let's try this equation. How would you solve for x in this equation? Unfortunately, you can't. This equation does not have a solution for x because there is no number that can multiply 0 to give 1. But there's actually another way that I can explain why there is no solution to this problem, and that is that if you try the same approach that I showed in the previous slide, you'll get stuck at the inverse because computing the inverse of 0 means computing 1 over 0, or in this case 0 over 0, which is not a real number. So the conclusion here is that not all numbers have an inverse. And you'll see that that's also the case for matrices. Not all matrices have an inverse. Now we get to matrices. And of course, things always get more complicated when you talk about matrices. But the initial motivation is exactly the same. So here I have an equation, ax equals b. a is a matrix, x is a vector. And of course, you know that a matrix times a vector always produces a vector, so therefore b must also be a vector. Now, let's imagine that we know what matrix A is, and we know what matrix B is, and we want to solve this equation for vector x. So how do you solve for x here? Well, the solution is going to be to isolate x, so, x on so only x appears on the left-hand side of the equation. And the solution to solving for x in an equation like this is to multiply both sides of the equation by A inverse. Now, A inverse is a matrix such that the inverse times the original matrix gives you the identity matrix. And you know from a video on the multiplicative identity that the identity matrix is the matrix equivalent of the number 1. So that means that the identity matrix times any other matrix or vector equals that matrix or vector. And of course, whatever you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other side of the equation. And so that gives us the solution to vector x in this original equation is a inverse times b. So this is one of the reasons why we need something like a matrix inverse. One important thing to know about using the matrix inverse, which is actually something more general about matrix multiplication in equations, is that if you multiply both sides of an equation by some matrix, then you have to multiply consistently on the left or on the right of the equation. So if you want to get rid of matrix A in the left-hand side of the equation, 
you have to left multiply by A inverse, but then you also have to left multiply the right-hand side of the equation by A inverse. Now, of course, that's not to say that you have to always multiply on the left-hand side. You can also multiply the right side of both sides of the equation by B inverse, and then that would be a way to cancel out B, assuming that B has an inverse. The thing that you are definitely not allowed to do is multiply matrices in different positions on different sides of the equation. So here I'm left multiplying by B inverse, but on this side of the equation I'm right multiplying by B inverse. And this sort of thing is definitely not allowed. Of course, you can multiply both sides by B inverse, but then it has to be consistently on the left like this, or consistently on the right, like you see here. This slide is a reminder about the rule of an operation that applies to multiple matrices, and I called this the live evil rule because live spelled backwards is evil. So the inverse of A times B times C, and then you know the, that product inverted, equals C inverse times B inverse times A inverse. But here you have to be really careful when working through this sort of thing because it's possible that the product ABC has an inverse but the individual matrices A and B and C do not have inverses. You will see examples of this kind of situation in later sections of this course. Okay, so now you have a conceptual understanding of what the matrix inverse is and why we need it in linear algebra. I'm sure you're wondering how to compute the inverse. So here is an example. This is a two by two matrix, and this matrix is invertible. So this matrix, in theory, has an inverse. Now, you might be thinking that the inverse of this matrix would be each individual element inverted, like this, and I can tell you that your linear algebra course would be much, much easier if this would be correct, if this were the way to compute the inverse. Unfortunately, it's not so simple. This is definitely not the inverse of this matrix. And that is easy to prove by multiplying these two matrices together. So if this really were the inverse of this matrix, then a times A, well, this isn't really A inverse, but this matrix times this matrix should produce the identity matrix, but that is not the case here, so this is not the inverse of A. Now, computing the inverse of a matrix is more complicated, and I will go through several ways to compute the inverse in later videos in this section. One of the things that makes the inverse of a matrix more complicated than the inverse of a scalar is that not all matrices have an inverse. In fact, many, many matrices are not invertible. If a matrix has an inverse, it is called invertible. Sometimes it's called non-singular. There are several other terms, full rank. But if a matrix has an inverse, then it is a square matrix and it is full rank. So if you come across a matrix and it's a square matrix and it has full rank, then you know for sure that that matrix has an inverse. In later videos, I will provide several mathematical explanations for why these two requirements are the case, but for now, you can just commit to memory these two criteria. So a matrix is invertible if it is square and full rank. Now, it turns out that some rectangular matrices also have an inverse, and I will discuss that later in this section. Those are called one-sided inverses. But it's useful to know whether a matrix even has an inverse before trying to compute the inverse. And that's because computing the inverse of a matrix is time-consuming and it's difficult, and it can produce numerical instabilities and errors. And that leads me to the final point that I want to make in this video. In theory, that is, when you are doing linear algebra with a pen and a piece of paper, then the inverse is great. And as long as a matrix is invertible, then you can just write down the matrix inverse as much as you want. You can invert matrices as often as you want, and it's going to help you solve all sorts of problems. However, in real applications,
particularly when dealing with the kinds of large-scale data sets that people are working with more and more these days with big data and machine learning applications, it's actually best to avoid explicitly inverting a matrix whenever possible. That's because there are numerical inaccuracies and instabilities and computer rounding errors, and so the inverse might not actually be accurate. Here you can see an example of this. This is a 3x3 three three matrix. It is theoretically invertible because I've added some noise. So in theory, this matrix is invertible. However, when I tried to compute its inverse using the MATLAB function inv, you can see that MATLAB gave a warning. It said matrix is close to singular, so you already know that term, or badly scaled. I will discuss this more in a future section on the singular value decomposition. And it says results may be inaccurate. And you can also compare the magnitudes of the numbers. These are integers here, or these are you know single digits here, and double digits, and the inverse is some astronomical number around 10 to the 15. And then you can see when I tried to multiply this matrix by its inverse, that should give the identity matrix, but it actually doesn't. It gives something that's kind of close to the identity matrix, but this is definitely not exactly the identity matrix. Fortunately, this is an issue that many computer scientists and applied mathematicians are thinking about and actively working on. There are many algorithms that are implemented in MATLAB and Python and other programming environments where you can solve computations that, in theory, require the inverse, but can also be solved without explicitly computing the inverse. So if you are planning on working with large matrices containing data, then this is something you should be aware of. In this video, I introduced you to the matrix inverse. Briefly, the matrix inverse is a matrix that multiplies another matrix to produce the identity matrix. The primary use of the matrix inverse is to solve matrix equations by canceling a matrix on one side of the equation. A matrix has an inverse if it is square and full rank, and finally, in practice, you want to avoid explicitly computing the matrix inverse when possible. In the next several videos, you will learn some different algorithms for computing the matrix inverse.